Les, thank you for being here today. We enjoy very much your presentation. Uh, I'd like for you to share with us the view over the next few years of this field. How do you see that it's going to evolve in a clinical perspective? It's an important question of where are we going, where have we been? And I think we've been restricted to relatively small trials uh, size where drawing appropriate conclusions has somewhat limited the speed. But I think we've crested that limitation. We're now at 300 patient phase 2B, at 1,700 patient phase 3 trials that I think will give us that really much needed database to get more clinical application of this across the world. But I think mm -hmm. it's needed a trial base. It needed evidence to support what we've suggested. The lessons we've learned have changed our approach almost categorically. And I think that's what the world needs to see is it's not mm -hmm. what was reported in meta-analysis of the first eight or 10 years using only the patient's autologous bone marrow cells to now all the different sources and types that we can put into play. So I think the evidence is forthcoming. I think the last 20 years or 25 years, we've seen in heart failure a dramatic change in the approach. And this probably also matches what's happening in other fields of medicine. When we looked at this rapid change, and we looked at the number of uh, the people that were training today, students, residents, fellows, and, and the field of cardiovascular medicine, what advice would you give to someone in training or junior faculty as they come to the field in being well prepared for the future? And, and maybe share on your experience in your career, uh, advice to junior faculty and fellows and residents in training. I think the field of cardiovascular medicine still has phenomenal draw. The physiology and what you're seeing and the prevalence and the need has brought a steady stream of fellows to want to train in this discipline. But I think heart failure is really one of the fields within cardiovascular medicine that has the greatest need and for which we've developed new technologies. But there's still an expensive intervention, and I think we're going to need new things beyond drugs. We've only gone so far. There was 12, 15 years between approved drugs and this latest round of drug therapy is still an important caveat. But I think that's where I see the field of regenerative medicine playing a role in every aspect of cardiovascular medicine therapy. And I think it's going to be an exciting part for new trainees to think about including that in their view of where it's going to go. The catheterization guys had a resurgence after angioplasty with structural heart disease. The electrophysiologists got atrial fibrillation in many different ways of going about that intervention. And uh, I think that those who are interested in interventional cath will see these cells on stents and a whole new application of that. I think that this field will be very much influenced by regenerative medicine in the next five years. Mm -hmm. as, as we move in, in this field, you think that the therapeutic application will be in the hands of surgeons, cardiologists, or will, will the technology force a new movement of physicians that are training in a variety of areas with more attention to the disease process rather than to skills that you acquire in training? I think it will be in the hands of all of the above. Uh, I think that the surgeons, uh, as I suggested, when they're in the operating room, they're right there. And I think instead of just trying to inject it through a needle, that they'll have scaffolds and patches that they'll be able to put stem cells and matrix and things. So the surgeons will be very well benefited by this adjunctive therapy. Uh, the interventional docs will be seeing it in there. But I think my vision is that this will take a while, but it will become a discipline within cardiology mm -hmm. because it will not just be the technical delivery of cells, but it will be the understanding of the nuance of what cell and what circumstance and what application you're going to see this. So I think regenerative medicine will become a discipline within cardiovascular medicine, but it will always be in conjunction with the surgeons and the interventionalist uh, to help deliver these cells. Mm -hmm. We, over the last, I guess, 30 years, we've seen a dramatic change in how we were trained, how the new fellows are trained, how the field has progressed. If you look back at your training and you see the advancement today, would you, would you have done the same thing? Would you have come into cardiovascular medicine within a field of a specialty or would you, in your personal career, do you think that you've gone, have done something different? 
I think that uh, I, like you, fell in love with intense cardiovascular medicine and advanced heart failure when I was first exposed to it. And I was fortunate when I finished my training to go to an institution that was one of three in the country doing mechanical cyst devices, the first in the Midwest to do heart transplantation. As soon as I saw that, I was completely convinced that was my career path. So fortunate in that regard. Um, it's interesting since I've been involved in stem cell therapy particularly, I've become very interested in neurology because of the so sophistication and, mm -hmm. and really plasticity of the brain and the intricacies that it almost dwarfs what the cells are in the cardiovascular. And yet many of the lessons of the antifibrotic of a stroke, could you help recover stroke functional capacity with that? So that's my only other, but I think it's one of those difficulties of medicine surgery, then you pick cardiology, then is it intervention or imaging or heart failure or whatever. I think there, those modalities all complement one another. And I think that you may find yourself more comfortable in technical procedures versus cognitive based uh, type things. But I think the field has given so many more options that's made it so much more exciting. I don't have any question that if I mm -hmm. was training right now today, I'd end up in the exact same place. It's interesting now that you mentioned that is like when you move a little bit from the very operational aspect of what we do every day and then you try to solve the illness process, you find that solutions to one problem are very similar to problems that appear to be very distant like in cardiovascular medicine that may apply to neurology or even oncology. It's hard to see when you're doing work every day taking care of patients, you almost have to distance yourself a little bit to appreciate that concept and maybe that comes with age. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, I think that one of the other aspects that I think is important for trainees is to think about global health. That again they don't get mired down into this cath lab and this small population I'm treating here but what will be the therapies that will have a global impact and what will be cost effective interventions and I think thinking about that having fellows train in underserved areas and, and get a sense of how much delivery is not all about the highest tech but about the biggest benefit and cost-effective benefit and thinking about those ways of approaching patient care I think is an important part of today's training. You know we talked about yesterday and in this casual conversation that we are so blessed for practicing in places like this where you have unlimited resources but when you train here and then go outside you see a different reality and, and sometimes in the training it's hard for a fellow or a junior faculty that's only worked in locations like this to appreciate the difficulties of, of dealing with a daily practice where the resources are not the way we have them here. And, and that's part of what I've said. I've been blessed to be in Africa and the Middle East and some very primitive areas of care and I think it really teaches you the goodness of all the high technology you have, but the fundamental of being patient advocate and really sitting down with people and, and really being humbled by what the needs are versus what the technology and costs can deliver. And I think that's why it's an essential part of a, a really broad program would be to give them an experience where they just have to come back down to the basics and understand physical diagnosis and listening and, and listening to histories where you're gonna help separate out and do things that will make a difference. So l let me ask you one final question that really has little to do with cardiology, but more with the medical field in general. Now there's a lot that has changed in f reimbursement, the complexities of, of, of getting paid and, and, and legal issues. And it, it seems like our profession over the years has lost some of the attributes that others looked into, or that many of us looked into. And and more and more, the practice of medicine has changed from individual relationships with patients to being part of groups and, and maybe being on, on large groups with uh, a lot of financial pressure that has caused some level of dissatisfaction of physicians. And I personally think that it's been the best thing that I've done in, well, I suppose, uh, I shouldn't say the only one, but. Uh, but the practice of medicine for me has been so rewarding that I, I would find it very difficult to do something else. But not everybody feels like that. And with the complexity of the, the today's environment, insurance, reimbursement, legal aspects, legislation, 
the, medi the medical field has become much more difficult for individual physicians to, to be fully satisfied with their profession for multiple reasons. What advice would you give to, again, fellows, residents, or junior faculty as they come into, or as they looked into the future years of medicine? You know, it starts all the way back at medical school and, and evolves through house staff training and fellowship training and so forth. Is uh, our medical students in 2013, 92% of them envisioned their practice being a group or being employed by a hospital. The shift work, the non-longitudinal care aspect, I think, is eroding seeing the goodness of being that patient's doctor and the privilege that that represents. And I, I don't know we get enough time to really impart the primacy of that. If you're going to really enjoy your career and your practice, it's not going to be based on recognition or revenue or whatever. It's harder with electronic medical record. It's harder with all the things that are going on, insurance and hassles and time embedded. But if you don't drop back to say, I really love being your doctor, that's the greatest thing in my career. I think it's going to be hard to sustain that uh, enjoyment of the practice. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of influences that are challenging that concept, but I think we need to get back at the fundamental level and keep trying to expose uh, trainees to that primacy. So I'm going to have to close with I see Dr. DeBakey's image there in the back, and I had the opportunity of taking care of Dr. DeBakey the last few years, along with many others. And I would go and visit him at his house. And he had a few hobbies. But the biggest one was his work. And he said, uh, he would say, Guillermo, we like to work, meaning that he enjoyed his work. But he also liked cars. So he said, well, I only have a few things that I really like outside my work, cars. So he, his major hobby was his work. And I think that that serves to me as a great line and example in life. I think if you really enjoy your work, it doesn't really matter what the pressures are. But if you don't, then you worry about all these other issues that will make you deter. So I, I couldn't say it any better, Guillermo. So, but that was the Bakey's. It was right there in the back. Well, so. we're all of that, so. <laughs> that uh, same approach to life. Les, thank you very much for yeah, having spent time with us today. Happier. Thank you so much I for inviting me. Thanks, Guillermo. Nice seeing you.